Isaiah 47. Uh, Isaiah 47 is about the city of Babylon. And God basically judging the city of Babylon. We'll have a look at some of those passages soon. But I'm preaching through the Rightly Dividing series. We'll be going through this series. And the title for the sermon this afternoon is Nakedness, Modesty, and Shame. Nakedness, Modesty, and Shame. And I'll tell you right from the beginning, some of you guys are not going to like what I'm preaching tonight, uh, this afternoon. Okay? Uh, but this chapter is about Babylon. And I don't want this church to become Babylon Baptist Church. Okay? I don't want God's judgment to fall upon His people here for the same reasons or the same uh, illustrations that we see happen to the city of Babylon. And so a lot of people have questions about nakedness, about modesty, shame. This will touch upon clothing standards as well. And it's important for us to see what the Bible has to say about this. Okay? But one thing I want to make very clear about a few couple of things here. When it comes to the Bible, there are some things that we have just the clear commandments about. Okay? There are some things that are just obvious. You just read it from the Bible, and that's what God says. That's what we need to do. There are other commands or principles or applications that we find in the Bible that are not necessarily strict commands. It's not like, thou shalt do this or thou shalt do that. But there's an expectation. Okay? And, I, and I, I mean this seriously. There is an expectation from God that you already know what is right and wrong. That the Lord has already written His law in our hearts. The Lord has already given us His Holy Ghost. The Lord has given us a born-again new man that will help us and a conscience and, and, and direct access to God. The, the seeking of wisdom and knowledge that will teach you other things as well so long as those things are consistent with the Word of God. You know, when you're seeking something and you think, well, I, I believe this is true, what you should strive to do is look at the Bible. Does this line up with the Bible? If it does, praise God, it's probably true. It may be a revelation that God has shown you just by the natural world, just by understanding things. But if it's not in accordance with the Bible, if it's contradicting the Bible, that is not wisdom, that is not instruction that has come from God. All right? So look at Isaiah 47, verse 3. The title, once again, is Nakedness, Modesty, and shame, and when we understand these things, this will help you know how you ought to dress in a pleasing way that pleases God. Isaiah 47, verse 3, look at this. Speaking of this city, Babylon, it says, Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, I will not meet thee as a man. You know, God is saying here that your nakedness will be uncovered, and your shame shall be seen. What will God do? He says, I will take vengeance. God will take vengeance when he sees these cities that are naked. Hey, and, and this is an illustration of, of a greater truth of what is nakedness. You know, if we are people that uncover ourselves, that show our nakedness, expect God's vengeance on your life. Expect God's judgment on your life. Okay? Now, when I said to you there are some things that are crystal clear, okay, we know, we can see clearly, God does not want you to be naked. That, that's quite clear as you read that. But what is nakedness? You know, how do you define nakedness? And as I said, there are some things that God just expects you to know. And I'll take the principle from 1 Corinthians eleven fourteen. It says, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man having long hair, it is a shame unto him, but if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. You know what God is saying here? You should know already. Nature should tell you. This should be common sense that men need to have short hair and women ought to have long hair. Okay? And the contentious person will say, well, how long is long? How short is short? Do you, is that how you want to live your life? Is that how you want to live your Christian life? Just, okay, God, tell me exactly how long my hair needs to be to be considered long. Or how short it has to be exactly to be considered short. You know, there are some things that are just obvious, right? Doth not even nature itself teach you. Do I even need to tell you this? And yes, God spends half a chapter explaining how important it is for men to have short hair and women to have long hair. But the expectation was that you should know that already. Right? There are there some things that are just common knowledge to man. And when it comes to hair length, brethren, no matter where you are in this world... It is universally accepted that long hair is for a woman and short hair is for a man. I'm, not, I'm sure there are exceptions out there. Of course there are exceptions. But when you look at nations as a whole, the majority of women will have long hair. 
the majority of men will have short hair. Okay? And these aren't Bible-believing Christians. They didn't turn to 1 Corinthians 15 and read it. Okay? It just comes naturally. It's what they already know. You guys are in Isaiah 47. Look at verse number 2. Let's take the definition that we can from the Bible here. Isaiah 47 verse 2. It says here, Take the millstones and grind mill. Now notice the next word. Uncover thy locks. Now the, the word locks is your hair. Okay? It's, it's referring to Babylon here as a woman. And it's uncovering her, like taking her hair uh, from being tied to uh, uh, uncovering it. And then it says this, make bare the leg, uncover the thigh. Notice that we have two uncoverings here. We have uncovering of the hair, the locks, and we have the uncovering of the thigh. Pass over the rivers. Look at verse number three. Again, thy nakedness shall be uncovered. Let's stop there. As Bible reading readers, we read this, as, as people are studying the Bible, we see in verse number three, it says, thy nakedness shall be uncovered. Say, well, what's uncovered? Well, we go back to verse number two, and it says there are two things specifically that are being uncovered, your hair and your thigh, okay? Now, I'm just going to ask for just your natural common sense understanding here. Do you think the uncovering of the nakedness here is referring to the hair or to the thigh? Uh, Yeah, to the thigh. You could make an argument with the hair, but come on. Are you using using common sense there? Are you using logic? You know, doth nature tell you that, uh, did nature tell you that it's hair? That's, that's nakedness? Of course not, okay? This is definitely a reference to the thigh. When you uncover the thigh, when your thigh is on show, guess what you're doing? You're uncovering your nakedness. Your nakedness, okay? Your thigh is part of what the Bible classifies as nakedness. Now go to Isaiah chapter 20, just a few chapters back. Isaiah chapter 20, verse 3. Isaiah chapter 20, verse 3. We have another definition of nakedness here, another classification. This time talking about uh, the northern kingdom of Israel. And it says here, because, you know, if you remember, the northern kingdom of Israel was under, um, was, was um, taken captive by the Assyrians. And it says here in verse number 3, And the Lord said, Like as my servant Isaiah have walked naked and barefoot three years as a sign and wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians prisoners and the Ethiopians captives, young and old, naked and barefoot. Look at this. Even with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. And they shall be afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia, their expectation, and of Egypt, their glory. What is the shame here? What is the nakedness? That's being referred to. We don't need to know the passage or the sort of context right now, guys. Just what is being referred to as nakedness here, guys? The buttocks. Okay? Now, the Bible says every word of God is pure. So I'm going to try to use as many biblical words as I can here, okay? Of course, we've got children here. I'm keeping that in mind, but I'm going to try to use God's word as much as possible. Now, this makes perfect sense. If the thigh is nakedness, well, just a little bit above the thigh, on the reverse, right, is your buttocks. Okay? And the Bible uh, says, if you uncover your, your behind, that is uncovering your nakedness. And so, you know, when the plumber comes to your house, right, and, and, and he's got his plumber look, right, he's got his pants down, and you can see his crack, that's nakedness, all right? That's nakedness. It's not a good look, you know? Buy him a belt, you know? Give him a tip. Buy him a belt or something when, he, when he's at your house fixing your things, all right? Uh, what about the, the, I don't know, if, is this in fashion anymore? I, I remember... Uh, Maybe, maybe a decade ago, the low-rider jeans on girls. Low-rider jeans. I, I found it disgusting. You could see the beginning of their, their buttocks, okay? The Bible says that's nakedness. That's nakedness. They weren't covering anything, okay? They were, they were low, and you could see the start of it. You could start seeing the shape of it. That's nakedness, okay? I, I never wanted to marry one of those girls that were dressed like that, Okay? That's nakedness. And guess what? Bikinis, Speedos, all of these things, guys, they're not, you, you might as well just not have them on. Okay? You're already naked. You're already naked when you're in that area. And so be careful about how you dress. Be careful also where you go because people could be dressed a certain way. That's not good for your eyes. Okay? And I don't care how righteous and how I've been saved for this long. I'm such a mature. I don't care. You know, God has put in the DNA of a man to be attracted to the appearance of a woman, the shape of a woman. And women are naturally attracted to men. 
I don't care what you say, okay? And you have to make a conscious effort to not give in to that temptation. Look away from that temptation, okay? Um, you know, and, and girls say, oh, well, that's, who, that's his problem if he's looking at me. No, it's your problem as well, okay? And especially if you're a Christian, especially if you're in the house of God and the way you dress could cause your brother in Christ to have impure thoughts, okay? You've got to be careful. We spoke about this morning about serving, ministering to one another. Well, guess what? You can minister to one another with the way you dress, okay? Or you can cause people to stumble, people to be tempted by the way you dress. How do you want to be? Now, listen, this is nakedness. This is what the Bible classifies as nakedness. Buttocks, and we see pretty much from the hip down all the way to your thigh. That's what the Bible describes as nakedness. Now, just as much as long hair differentiates a woman from a man that's, that's got short hair. I mean, look, when, you, when, you, when someone's far away and you see someone with long hair, you're pretty confident that's a woman over there. That's a pretty, pretty confident that's a man over there. Every now and again, though, you're driving a car and, you, you know, your, your immediate thought, that's a man. Then you're driving, oh, honey, was that a man or a woman, right? Why? Because of their hair, okay? Uh, or, or vice versa. I'm sure you've seen men with long hair. Like, what? Is that a... I remember uh, when I was, uh, flew down to Sydney once for church, I was going through the airport, I went through the, the, the food court thing, and I saw a, what I thought was a woman with long hair. Not only did I think it was a woman with long hair, but she, had a, she he, he was, had a dress, right? I'm going past, I'm like, what in the... And I'm, I'm thinking like, I'm, what, what am I looking at? I have no idea what I'm looking at, okay? It, it boggled my mind. I couldn't tell if that was a, it was a man, okay? It was a man with long hair and a dress. But look, just as much as hair should differentiate... You know, a man and woman, well, you know what's a greater differentiation between men and women? What's the greatest distinction? I mean, we have a lot of differences. We have a lot of physical differences, a lot of physical differences. We have even emotional differences between men and women. There's a lot of differences. But the main difference, and I'll be careful with the way I, I use this. Remember, every word of God is pure. The main difference between men and women is what the Bible calls privy members. Okay, the privy members. And guess where that is? Well, if the, if the buttocks and the thighs are considered nakedness, guess what else is part of that area? Okay, the privy member, the private parts. Okay, the Bible uses this word, the privy member, so that's what I'm going to use uh, as I speak about this. That is the most significant difference between a man and woman. Okay, I mean, anybody can tell you that is the biggest difference between the man and woman, okay? And so, the uh, Bible, in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5, says, the woman, now I'm going to talk about dress here, it says, the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garments, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Do you want to be an abomination to the Lord your God? The Bible tells us, there is clothing that belongs to a man. There is clothing that belongs to a woman. Okay? Now, you know, we might have different thoughts as to what that could be. Okay? And I, I don't think it's that complicated. Just as much as hair can distinguish a man and a woman, and just as much the preview members distinguish the differences between a man and a woman, so shall the clothing, so should the clothing that covers those preview members. So should be the clothing that covers the nakedness of men and women should be just as distinctive as the preview members that are behind those garments, okay? That's another clear way that we, as a society, as, as nature itself teaching us, that is the difference between a man and woman by what they wear from their hips to their thighs, okay? And it's no surprise to many of you that I believe men should wear pants and women should wear dresses or skirts, okay? And not vice versa. That is cross-dressing, okay? And the argument is, well, where does the Bible say that women should wear, shouldn't wear pants? Where does the Bible say that men can't wear skirts? Or maybe there are some passages that appear to say that men are wearing skirts. Well, you know what? I'm wearing a skirt right now. Okay? You know what the Bible refers to skirts many times when it comes to men? Or all the time when it comes to men? The hem of your garment. Okay? Around this coat right now, the bottom bit, that's a skirt. Okay, but am, am I wearing a skirt? Now, I'm going to present the case to you that pants are for men and skirts and dresses are for women, and I'm going to address this in three different ways. Number one, I'm going to talk about the cultural reasons, okay? 
Number two, I'm going to talk about a logical reason. And number three, I'm going to give you the biblical reason. Okay, I'm going to hit it from those three different areas. Cultural, logical, and biblical. Let's start with cultural. Let's start with cultural. Okay? When you think about our society today, think about our society today. Would you say our society today has a greater fear of God, has a greater respect and love for the Bible today than they did 100 years ago? Would you say that people today are striving to live after the commandments of God? People are striving to know the way of salvation. Do people have a fear of God today? A lot of people don't even believe He exists. All right? Or, or they just have a God of their own imagination. Think about this, brethren. If a hundred years ago, let's say maybe even more than a hundred years ago, where people at least had a fear of God, I'm not saying they were necessarily saved, they just had a fear of God in society, they had a respect for what the Bible said, whether they did it or not, they still had a respect for what the Bible says. Think about the dress standards a hundred years ago, just a hundred years ago, when they had the Bible as their somewhat authority, okay? When, when, when our politicians somewhat built laws and commands, instruction on the Word of God, how did people dress? What about today? We're further away, aren't we? We're further away from the laws of God. We're further away as a society with a love and respect for the Bible. We're further away from a fear of God. A fear of, there is no fear of God today out there. Man, we've got to bring the That's why we go door knocking. That's why we've got to tell them, hey, you're going to hell because we're trying to bring back the fear. Okay? It's not there anymore. We have to bring it there door to door. And look, how has dress standards changed? Has it changed? Absolutely. What's changed? Well, like I told you, was men wearing dresses, men wearing skirts, but something that's more common, women wearing pants. Women wearing pants. And look, I, I, look, I'm not basing my beliefs on culture here, okay? I'm just saying, look at it. Open your eyes, okay? I, I, I'm not going to base my doctrine on culture, but it tells us something about society. It does give us some level of instruction as to what's changing, okay? When I was a child, people made fun of the cross-dressers. People made fun of the trans, what do you call them? Trannies, the trans, whatever, the men that wore dresses and lipstick and stuff like that. You know, when I was a child, people hated that. They mocked that, okay? It's not just now, look, in 2019, that's not, it's, that's accepted now, right? It's accepted for men to dress like that. But it's more than that. We've gotten past that. Now we have a society, we have generations saying to their children, well, you can decide if you want to be a boy or girl. Who cares what your preview members are? Who cares? Don't worry about that. Don't worry about your DNA. Don't worry about your X and Y chromosome. If you want to be a boy, you can be a boy. If you want to be a girl, you can be a girl. Can you imagine that? I can't imagine that when I was a child. I was, we were mocking the cross-dressers. Okay. Now that's, that's like, that's gone. Forget, that's not the issue anymore. The issue is, do you want to be a boy or a girl? Children making these decisions, having life-changing surgery, hormones put into their bodies. They're never going, the boy will never be a girl, and the girl will never be a boy, okay? But what's led up to that, brethren? I'll tell you what's led up to all that. Feminism, cross-dressing between men and women, the culture has changed. And unfortunately, Christians are changing with the culture. Instead of going back, well, what were things like when people had a fear of God? It's like, well, who cares? All right? If it's acceptable in our society, it should be acceptable in our church. No, brethren. That's not how it ought to be. Okay? That's not how things ought to be. And so, you know, culture is not my primary reason. I'm just putting it out there as an argument. Okay? Again, I think nature itself is teaching us some things, okay? But the opposition to this, and, and you know, some people say, take the opposition, well, you shouldn't, you shouldn't build biblical doctrine on culture, you know, such as, you know, some people teach on this topic and they say, well, what is the universal sign on the toilet door? You know, on, on, the, on the men's toilet door, there's a man with pants. That's a universal sign, and the universal sign for a woman is a woman in a, in a skirt, okay? That's a good argument. I'm not, you know, I'm not, not I'm saying that's pretty good, yeah. That's, that's, that's a cultural understanding as well, you know, internationally understood, okay? But I'm not going to build my doctrine on signs on a door, okay? But here's the thing, here's the thing. Those that are in opposition to taking a cultural view will say, well, yeah, you know, you shouldn't build doctrine on culture, which I agree, which I largely agree, 
But then you turn around to those same people and say, well, then how do you decide? How, how should we decide then what, what is men's and women's clothing? You know what the answer has been for people that have asked that? Well, whatever is in the women's section, that's for women. And whatever's in the men's section at the shops, that's for men. Okay, so I can't use culture, but you can use culture. <laughs> you know, the, the argument, the opposition against using culture is using culture. You just cancel each other out then. Right? You, you, in fact, you're not in opposition to anything because you're bringing your own cultural beliefs into the equation. Now, I would love it if, if that was, I, I would love it, you know, if I could go to the men's section and just find men's clothes. I would love it if I could just go to the women's section and find women's clothes. You know, I say, well, what's the difference between, you know, a, a men's pants and women's pants? Well, generally, if you look at the differences, women's pants are a lot more tighter. They're a lot more fitting, right? They're a lot more, they're just, they're just it's kind of like, when you look at it, you can obviously see that's women's pants because they're not so baggy, they're not so uh, loose as men's pants. Well, guess what's happened? Men's pants have become skinny jeans, right? Men's pants have become tighter. Men's, like, I've tried on pants, I'm like, well, I can't put this on. It's got my length, but it hasn't got my, 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 my width here. What's going on? You know? And then, oh, slim fit. Where's the, why, what, what's the opposite to slim? Loose. Where's the loose fit jeans? You know, can you find me that? Shouldn't this belong in the women's section, if that's what differentiated? No, brethren, society's changing, culture is changing. You can't decide what is men's and women's clothing based on, on, on what these designers have done. In fact, many of these designers are homosexuals. Many of these designers want men to look like women and women to look like men. Many of these designers have, have, have dressed you a certain way so you can be more sexually appealing to the opposite sex and commit fornication. That's why they design what they design. Okay? Why would you take what they say is women's and men's clothing and run with that? Why don't you go back to society when we feared God and saw the differences there? Okay? That's the argument from the cultural viewpoint. And then the other opposition to this is, well, what about those places in the world where men wear skirts? You know, that's culturally accepted in China. Oh, yeah, because, you know, China's such a great Christian nation. Is that why? <laughs> I mean, think about it. What, what's China known for? Buddhism? Taoism? All right? Praying to dead relatives? Is that where you're going to get your inspiration for where you should, how you should dress? Because Chinese men wear skirts sometimes? Well, India, India. Oh man, have you seen those Indian gurus? All right, with their skirts. Oh man, that's culturally acceptable in India. Hey, they edify men as gods. They're polytheistic in their view. Is that, is that the cultural view you want to take and bring to the argument as how you should dress godly? How you should please the Lord with your style of dress? You know, Samoa, the po Polynesian, Pol Polynesian nations where they wear, I forget what they call it, Sarong, yeah, they've got different names for it, Sarong, uh, they wear that, well, yeah, there's a lot of Christians out there, yeah, there's a lot of false teaching out there as well, there's a lot of Mormons, there's a lot of JWs, I mean, the cults love to go into the Polynesian areas, because they almost believe anything, you tell them, I mean, it's a great place for soul winning, you know, they'll believe, they're, they're more likely to believe the gospel, they're more likely to be receptive, but these places in the world that are more receptive are also more receptive to the cults. Okay, is that where you're going to build your culture from? I mean, is, is Samoa the nation that's sending out missionaries across the world? You know, is, is, that, is that where God is, is, is uh, you know, bringing, the, you know, new leaders and, and gospel preachers from? You know, what about the ancient Egyptians and, and the Romans? You know, ancient Egyptians, yeah, well, with their polytheistic gods, with their half-gods, half-animal uh, religion. Is that, is, again, is that where you're going to be based on the Roman, Roman Empire? In their, 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 again, their, their Jupiters and their, I don't know, their false gods. I mean, think about it. Of course, religion has an effect on the culture, has an effect on the way people dress. You know, and look, I wouldn't be surprised. In fact, I'm, I'm confident that in these ancient civilizations, men wore pants. It's just that they probably weren't drawn on the walls wearing pants. Okay? It's usually these people that elevate themselves as gods or something important that put on you know, like cross-dress, basically, okay? And, uh, you know, if you look up, some people have, I've, I've heard it said that pants are a new invention. You know, it's something that's just come into, you know, in the, in the last couple of hundred years or something. You know, if you just go to Google, type in the world's oldest pants, you know what they found? They found pants that go back 3,000 years ago, before Jesus Christ, in China, out of all places, 
okay, in China. You know, 3,000 years ago, men wore pants. Hey, that's the oldest found. It, it, it's a rare find because nothing's meant to last that long normally, okay? After a few thousand years, I mean, material just deteriorates, right? The bacteria eats it away or whatever. It rots away. This is a rare find. It's not like this is when the pants started. The fact that they found it 3,000 years ago just confirms to us that they've been using it for thousands of years. I would say they've been using it from the very beginning, okay? Once God clothed Adam and Eve. So look, I'm not going to build my understanding of clothing on cultures that are ungodly. Say, what about the Scottish kilt? Oh man, the Scottish kilt. You know, that's just a recent thing. You know, it's only been around since the 16th, like what we know as the modern day Scottish kilt has only been around for, since the 16th century, from like 1700s, all right? You know, before that, you know, actually there's that movie, Braveheart. I've never seen it, okay? So I'm not promoting Hollywood. I've never seen it. But apparently there's this Scottish hero, William Wallace, you know, uh, you know, did, did some, had some great victories for, for, for Scotland, and they, in the movie, he's wearing a kilt. You know, the kilt was not invented for several hundred, several, several hundred of years until af- after William Wallace. He never wore a kilt. You know, if you look him up, he wore pants, like a man. Okay? That's what he wore. And you know where the kilt comes from? It wasn't even a, a skirt. It was a coat. You know, it was, it was uh, used by Scottish soldiers. They would have a, 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 a coat quite a long coat, and they would sleep in that coat at night when they get cold. It was just a coat, like from top to bottom, all the way down, okay? And then over time, they eventually put like a, instead of putting a belt, like I've got a belt underneath my coat, they put the belt around the coat. So then it was kind of like that, with a belt, okay? To keep it still. Now, uh, uh, what I read was King George II, because he was the king of England and Scotland at the time, uh, and they did not, li- they did not like the idea of um, uh, people wearing kilts, you know, from the top to bottom, where they, they banned it because, again, it was something that soldiers mostly wore. And they wanted a united kingdom, not a separated kingdom. So they banned the kilts. And guess where the modern-day kilt comes from? Well, after he banned them, people started protesting, and they started to put on modern-day kilts as skirts, basically. There was no practical reason why men ever wore skirts, even in Scotland. Okay, it was, it was a sign of protest. I, I, I didn't know this. I went to look it up because I wanted to see why the Scottish men, why, why were they wearing kilts? What, what, what could they do in kilts that they couldn't do in pants? And I realized this was, there was no practical reason. It was just someone, they were protesting against the king. That's all. all right? And that's become a, you know, something that now today in Scotland they use. Again, guys, are we going to use these examples, though, to build our understanding of how we need to dress? Okay, so I, I presented to you a, a cultural view. Now, when you look at the nations, the nations, the peoples that God has used, where the Bible has been published, where missionaries have come from, okay, where the Word of God is being proclaimed, those nations, guess what? Women wore skirts and pants, men, uh, skirts and dresses, men wore pants. Okay? When you look at where God used His Word, where churches were established, where missionaries were sent from, Guess how they dress? Men pants, women skirts and dresses. So that's my argument from a cultural perspective. And I don't think we should ignore that. I think it's important, but we shouldn't build our doctrine just on something like that, okay? We shouldn't build our doctrine, on, of course, on the Word of God. The next point that I wanted to bring is logical. The lo- and I already kind of brought this up very, very early on, okay? But if the privy members, which fall under the scope of nakedness, and are the most important differences between men and women. If, if that's the most <laughs> important difference between the two, then doesn't logic just tell you when you cover up those previous members, we ought to have a distinction in that area between men and women? If that's the most important difference that God has put in place, okay, reproduction, okay, then if we're going to have clothing that differs, there's some difference between men and women's clothing, where would that fall? Logically. Well, it would fall logically where the biggest difference are between men and women. I'm just appealing to your logic here. Okay? I think this is common sense. I don't think I need to really bring this out. I think most people, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Okay? Now, if that doesn't make sense to you, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Okay? There are some things that doth not even nature itself teach you. Okay? That's all I have on logical. That's all I have on logical. But now I want to go to biblical. Take your Bibles and go to Exodus 28. Exodus 28, verse 40. Oh, man, you're going to turn to the commandment. You know, uh, 
you know, <clears throat> thou shalt, men, thou shalt wear pants. You're going to turn to that commandment, aren't you? Well, there's, there's no commandment like that, okay? But there is a difference. There is a difference between men's and women's clothing. And we're going to look at that in the Bible. Look at Exodus 28, verse 40. Exodus 28, verse 40. We want to take a biblical perspective here, a biblical view. It says here, Exodus 28, verse 40, talking about... Now, the Bible doesn't always tell us about how people are dressed in the Bible, okay? Now, we know that uh, John the Baptist had a, had a leather belt, basically, around his, his waist. Guess what he was holding up? Pants. All right? Let's have a look at this. Uh, biblical. Uh, this is, we're looking at the, um, the way the priests were dressed. Exodus 28, verse 40. And for Aaron's sons, thou shalt make coats. Now, this is important for you to remember. Thou shalt make coats, and thou shalt make for them girdles, that's a belt, and bonnets. If you remember the, the thing, or I don't know if you've seen the pictures, it had quite a tall hat thing going on, the, the priest back then. Uh, thou shalt make for them for glory and for beauty. And thou, shalt put upon, uh, and thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother, and his sons with him, and shalt anoint them, and consecrate them, and sanctify them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. Look at this. And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. From the loins, that's basically like your hips area, even unto the thighs they shall reach. Hey, this is consistent. What do they wear? Breeches. This is just an old term of saying pants. Okay? They wore pants, and guess what else was made for them? Coats. Okay? Now, they had longer coats than this, but they had coats. And guess what's on the coat? A skirt. Okay? This becomes important, okay, because there are those that say, well, the priests had skirts. Well, hold on. Did we read they were wearing skirts? No, they had pants, okay, and they had a coat around them, okay. So what we see, now we don't have much more to go by, okay. Again, we don't have thou shalt wear pants in the Bible. But what do we see? When we see how God is instructing a man to dress, yes, a priest, but it's a man. What does it say? Pants, pants on the man. Pants to cover his nakedness, from his loins to his thighs, okay? Now, let's look at the women. Go to Jeremiah chapter 13. Jeremiah chapter 13. And we're going to read some passages that are a little bit, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Every word of God is pure. <laughs> let's, let's just say that, okay? Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 26, okay? Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 26. And the context here, kind of like what we started to preach about Babylon and starting to see some troops there, the context here is about the city of Jerusalem, okay? And, and God is talking about the city of Jerusalem. They're, they're soon going to be uh, taken into captivity by the Babylonians. And God is telling them about how unfaithful they are, okay? And look at Jeremiah 13, verse 26. Therefore, he says this about Jerusalem, Therefore will I discover thy skirts upon thy face, and thy shame may appear. Verse 27, I have seen thine adulteries, and thy nains, and lewdness of thy whoredom, and thine abominations on the hills of the fields. Woe unto thee, O Jerusalem! Wilt thou not be made clean? When shall it once be? Now you can look at this chapter as much as you want, but you'll notice that God refers to the city of Jerusalem in the, in the feminine form, as a female okay, as a female. And God's telling them, look, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to embarrass you. I'm going to shame you, city, okay? And how does, what illustration that it does is you? Look at verse number 26 again. And I'm sorry, but again, it's the word of God here. Therefore will I discover thy skirts. Let's stop there for a minute. This woman, the city of Jerusalem, allegorically or illustratively, what is it wearing? A skirt, okay? A skirt. Now, what kind of skirt? Therefore, I discover thy skirts upon thy face, that thy shame may appear. What is that in reference of? Look at verse 27. I have seen thy adulteries. Okay? This is using, you know, the illustration of the preview members, basically. Okay? Now, a woman would typically wear a skirt, okay, from the hips, right? And if you're doing it biblically, to the, covering the thighs, right? But here's the thing. If you took a skirt that long from your hips to your, say to your knee, to your knee area, and you flipped it, you reversed it, it's not going to cover your face exactly. The, the length from your hips to, to your face is actually longer than from your hips to your knees. Okay, that's just 
pretty much universal with anybody. But if this case, if the skirt's able to cover the face, okay, it's been lifted up showing, to show the nakedness, right? It's been lifted up, guess what? That means the skirt that God is referring to here, I know it's illustrative, okay, would be longer than past your knees, going past your knees. Okay? Now I'm not saying, this is saying, thou shalt wear a skirt that's past your knees. That's not what it's saying. I'm just, I'm just trying to show you how God is using the illustration of a skirt here that if you flipped it over and you uncovered the woman's nakedness, it would cover her face. That's a pretty long skirt. It's a pretty decently long skirt, okay, being used there, okay? Why didn't he just refer to the breeches on the woman there? Oh, you know, I'm going to pull down your breeches. Because women, in that day, all right, logically and culturally, it should be universally understood, they were wearing skirts. That's why. And God just expects you to know that as you read it. Go to Lamentations, the next book in the Bible. Lamentations. 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 So Jeremiah is about how Israel, uh, sorry, how Jerusalem is going to be cap, cap, um, taken captive by the Babylonians. And then Lamentations is about when the Babylonians have already taken uh, Jerusalem. Okay? They've already conquered Jerusalem in Lamentations chapter 1, verse 8. Lamentations chapter 1, verse 8. It says here, Jerusalem have grievously sinned, therefore she is removed. All that honored her despise her, because they have seen her nakedness. Yea, she sigheth and turneth backward. Look at this. Her filthiness is in her skirts. She remembereth not her last end, therefore she came down wonderfully. She had no comforter, O Lord, Behold my affliction, for the enemy hath magnified himself. What, what happened to Jerusalem? They saw her nakedness, right? Verse number 9, her filthiness is in her skirts. Okay? She's been a whore. She's been an adulterous woman to, to God. And your filthiness is seen, as it were, illustrative again, on her skirts. Okay? Why? Because, again, everybody knows that women wear skirts. Okay? This is a description of a woman in, in the reference of a city here. Now I'm going to read you one more passage. You don't need to turn there. I'm going to turn to Nahum chapter 3 verse 4. Nahum chapter 3 verse 4. Nahum is preaching against Nineveh. So we're not talking about Jerusalem now. We're talking about a Gentile city, uh, Nineveh, of the Babylonians. And it says he uses the same language. Nahum chapter 3 verse 4. Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcraft, that selleth nation through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness and the kingdoms thy shame. What does God say about Nineveh? Again, your skirt's going to be flipped up. It's going to cover your face. I'm going to show the nations your nakedness, your shame. Again, using a feminine way of describing the city, and how a woman is dressed, okay? And of course, this would be super embarrassing if this was a real woman, her dress being lifted up to her face and her nakedness being shown to everybody, okay? So, look, oh, where's the verse? Women, thou shalt wear skirts. This is, this is all we get, guys. What do we see with men? Pants? What do we see with women? Skirts. I mean, are you, are you going to fight against that? What, what are you going to do? Okay? That's how the Bible has it. And it's written in a way expecting you to know this. Right? right? Expecting you to understand this. Expecting you to know this. And you might say, well, maybe these women and men that had multiple clothing in their closets, like we do. Multiple shoes, multiple pants, multiple... Sh Back in those days, clothing was super expensive. Okay? It's not like today where we're machines basically make clothing where everything comes from China with cheap labor. You know, if, I just had to look this up. If, if you wanted to get a properly made tailored suit, you know, where you'd got someone, <clears throat> they'd measure you up. You now this suit and the pants, it didn't cost me like 100 bucks, something like that, right, cheap. But if you wanted something made for you, and that's what they did back then, they made clothing for the person that wore it, right? Measured it up, put it all together, it would cost somewhere between $1,000 to $5,000, okay? And you'd get to the 1,000 mark, if you're importing the material from China or something. If you're getting it from Australia, yeah, it's going to get up there, like $4,000, $5,000, okay? Clothing was expensive back then. They didn't have a variety of clothes. They wore pretty much the same things all the time. 
okay? As they needed it, they, they, they bought clothing, okay? And, and a great illustration of this is when Jesus Christ is crucified. I'll just show you very quickly, Mark 15, 24. It says, and when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them what every man should take. They knew Christ was going to die. So, man, there's good clothing here. It's expensive. Thousands of dollars worth, right, in our eyes. Well, let's, let's divide it up. Let's see who can take what. Because it's, it's, it's valuable. Clothing back then was valuable. It's not like you had a skirt in your closet and then some pants there. No, the Bible uses this term. That's pretty much all they had. Pretty much all they had. You know, the, I, 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 just, I think back just a few generations where I hear stories of my parents. Are like, basically, we just we slept in what we wore at work. We bathed in the, in, the, in the river with the clothes that we wear kind of thing, right? I mean, it, it was ex- obviously expensive back in the days before uh, machinery to have clothing, and that's the time they lived in, right? It's expensive to have clothing. Now, if you guys can go to Psalm 133, please. Go to Psalm 133 for me. And I just want to address some opposition to this teaching. Psalm 133. And I, I, again, I'm not going to necessarily address every opposition you may have some verses you want to bring up that I don't really, you know, I, I can't spend a whole sermon going through every verse that people use, okay? But I just want to show you some things that people use to teach against this and say, well, men wore skirts or whatever. Psalm 133 verse 2, Psalm 133 verse 2 says, It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, and went down to the skirts of his garments. Aha! There it is. Aaron was wearing a skirt for a garment. There you go. Man, I just wasted how long have we been preaching this? So, no, look, what did Aaron wear? We already read it, right? Now, I'm going to turn to Exodus 29, where this is coming from. Exodus 29, verse 21. It just says, And thou shalt take the blood that is upon the altar and the anointing oil and sprinkle it upon Aaron and upon his garments. It just says garments. And upon his sons and upon the garments of his sons with him, and he shall be hallowed, and his garments, and his sons, and his sons' garments with him. So what was sprinkled with this oil of anointing? His garments. This is Exodus 29. What did we already read in Exodus 28, verse 42? And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness, from the loins even unto the thighs they shall reach. Just the chapter before, talking about the garments that these priests wore. They were in pants, not skirts. When the oil was put on these guys, they were wearing pants. The skirts I've been referring to are the skirts of their coats. Okay, the skirts or the hem of their coats. All right, that's one opposition that I've heard. And just to sort of bring this further into light, just a very quick one. I'll read it to you. You guys go to, um, you guys go to Exodus 20. Go to Exodus 20 for me. I'll turn f- to 1 Samuel 24 verse 4. 1 Samuel 24 verse 4. And the men of David said unto him, Behold the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose, look at this, and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. So was Saul, King Saul, wearing a skirt? I was wearing a robe, all right? And King David cut the skirt off his robe, okay, the bottom parts of the robe. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him, because he had cut off Saul's skirt. Okay? So, it was his robe. Okay? David did not cut a skirt, like a women's skirt, off King David, uh, King Saul. Okay? Now, you guys are in Exodus 20. Look at verse number 26. Exodus 20, verse 26. And this is the one. Aha! Here we go. Here we go. See? Men wore skirts in the Bible. It can't be the skirts and the pants that differentiate between men and women. So he said. Exodus 20, verse 26. Neither, this is talking about the priests, neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. All right, so one of the instructions when you built an altar was not to have steps in place. And the argument is there, well, hold on. If the man, when men were wearing pants, okay, how could you see their nakedness if they're climbing up the step? If they created steps and that would reveal their nakedness, how can that be unless they were wearing skirts? Well, let's just take for a minute that they were in skirts. Let's just take that for a minute. How far upstairs do you need to get to be able to look up someone's skirt? Pretty high. I mean, it's got to be above my eyesight. And not only just above my eyesight, you pretty much have to be right there. Like, <laughs> right, if they're wearing skirts. Is that, is that what it's about? We already saw that they were in pants. 
you know, up to, to the thighs, okay? And we already saw that the thighs are considered nakedness in the Bible, okay? So what's the principle here? Well, if you're climbing up steps, guess what's happened? You know, when you put on pants, when you, put on, when you buy clothing, you don't just stand still and walk like this. You know, when you move, you bend down, you run, you climb upstairs, guess what's going to happen? The garment's going to roll up a little bit, okay? You've got pants or skirts, right? And you start walking up the stairs, it's going to start revealing your thighs. It's going to uncover your nakedness. Hey, there's a great principle here. Make sure when you buy pants, not only does it cover your thighs, but as you're going about doing some type of activity, bending down, walking, sitting down in a chair, that it's still covering your nakedness. It's still covering your thighs. That's the principle to take out of that. Not that men wore skirts and people would look up their skirt and see the nakedness. No, it's just walking up, doing activity. You know this. Everyone knows this, right? You stretch, you sit, you get up, you bend down, you walk upstairs. It's going to pull up the garments on your, on your thighs. And so that's, that's all it is, guys. It's not some complicated... Look, I mean, does that verse say they're wearing skirts? No, but that's what they want you to believe, okay? That's what they want you to believe because they're contentious. They don't like what the Word of God teaches. I've spoken about mod, uh, sorry, nakedness. Let me get on, get on to modesty. modesty. If you guys can go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. Because... And look, I'm not having to go to the ladies in this church because I've seen it everywhere, all right? Every church. Ladies eventually get convinced, okay, yeah, I've got to wear a skirt. Okay, good. But then they come to church, they're wearing a skirt, but it's skin tight, all right? Skin tight. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. In like manner also, the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. You know, I looked up Cambridge Dictionary just on Google quickly. What is the definition of modest, okay? When it comes to, we know what what modest means. It means like not bringing attention to yourself. But when it comes to clothing, what's the definition there in Cambridge Dictionary? It says, the quality in women of dressing or behaving in a way that is intended to avoid attracting sexual interest. That's modesty. When the Bible says, in modest apparel, that's what it's saying. Dress in a way that is intended to avoid attracting sexual interest. Oh man, I've covered my nakedness. I've covered this. <laughs> the, the idea there is basically, uh, see, I've covered the skin. You can't see only the skin of my thighs or my loins or my buttocks. S- skin is not the issue. Brethren, it's the shape. It's the figure. It's the shape. That's what the issue is, brethren. Come on, don't tell me you don't get this. Don't tell me you don't know this. Of course you know this. Again, men are naturally attracted to the figure of a woman. Naturally. It's not like you just start with these impure thoughts. It's just that's how God made you to be, right? And that's why you go and find a woman, a wife, and settle down. And you make a commitment like Job did, right? A covenant with the eyes that I will not look upon a maid. It's settled. That's it. I've chosen this woman, you know? And women are attracted to the figure of a man. We're different. We put on weight differently. We put on fat differently. Women put fat around their hips and their thighs and men put it around their bellies and stuff like that, right? It, everything's different about us, you know? And believe it or not, men find the hips, childbearing hips, the shape of the thighs and the hips, they find that attractive. Oh, man, just you, Pastor Kevin. All men find that attractive, okay? So is covering your nakedness with a skirt, but it's skin tight so you can see every figure? And every, you almost might as well just wear pants. I mean, it's, it's probably less sexually attractive if a woman wore pants, right, baggy pants, than some tight-fitting skirt, you know, that rolls up when they sit down. You can see the thighs and all that. Think about what you're doing, all right? Are we, are we just trying to get by and do the minimum of God's commands? Are we trying to live properly and according to His laws and His ways? Yeah. Understanding, like, come on, man. We're, we're, we've got the same flesh and blood. The things that I find attractive, I know other men find attractive. The things my wife finds attractive, I know other women are going to find attractive. Okay? There's a right place to put all that, though. And that's in the marriage bed. That's between husband and wife. Okay? Not in church. Not at the beach. Not in these other places, not in public places. 
Okay? There's a proper place to uncover the nakedness. We'll go into that later on. <clears throat> like I said, Job says in Job 31, 1, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? You know what Job is saying here? I, wouldn't, I, I just naturally will think upon a maid. Job is one of the most righteous men that we read about in the Bible, perfect in his generations. And even he had to make a decision, I need to stop my eyes. I need to make a covenant, an agreement. Eyes, you're in obedience to the new man here. You don't look upon these other women like that. So Job, a righteous man. I don't think any of us are more righteous than Job. Okay? I mean, he was a great man, and he even struggled in this area. And I'm just saying, ladies, in this church, think about how you dress. You know, do you want your brother in the Lord to stumble? to have impure thoughts, to have wrong thoughts. We're here to serve one another. And uh, when it comes to modesty, not only should you not wear skin-tight clothing, that just shows every shape of your body, okay? But I'm going to talk about the breasts, okay? The breasts here. And I've heard it said, you know, breasts are not nakedness. And I agree. The Bible, you, you, you cannot build a, a biblical definition for breasts being naked. But you know one thing you can do? This is not just about nakedness. This is nakedness, modesty, and shame. Okay? Uncovering the breast is immodest. Is immodest. Okay? And the thought that, look, men, again, naturally find the figure of a woman attractive. That includes the breasts. I'm sorry for making you uncomfortable, okay? But this is, I've got to teach this stuff, right? I've got to teach it. Including the breast. And it's like, well, you know, mate. The thought there is, well, you know, breasts have only been sexualized in the Western cultures. You know, it's only a recent thing in, in the Western world. No, it's not. It's all over your Bible. It's all over your Bible. I'll just read to you. You need to turn all there, guys. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 10. The wife says to her husband, I am a wall and my breasts like towers. Then was I in his eyes as one that found favor. Song of Solomon, Proverbs 5, 18. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as a, as a loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breasts satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished always with her love. So where's the right place to, to appreciate one another? The marriage bed, husbands and wives. Verse 20 then says, Why and why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger. You know what it's saying there? The word bosom is just another saying breasts. Why would you look at another woman? What, in what reference? The breasts. Go and find a wife. That's the right place. That's the right place in the marriage bed. Union between husbands and wives to share that. Okay? So don't tell me that this is, you know, uh, you know breasts. Yeah, I know it's not nakedness. I get it. I, I get that. It's obvious. All right? but it's still something that attracts men, okay? It's, it's why our society doesn't walk around topless. Oh, I guess nudist speech and stuff like that, but, you know, forget them, right? I'm talking about normal human beings, right? There's a reason why we get dressed. It's because there's, there's something in you called shame. There's a conscience in you. There's something that nature itself teaches you, okay? And you cover your breasts, ladies, and again, just like pants or skirts, you're probably going to be moving your top. You're going to be bending down. You're going to be doing things. Well, dress in a way where it's safe. Even if you're doing something. Now, look, if something accidentally gets exposed, it's obviously not on purpose. Okay, you know, every, everyone knows whether you're trying or you're not trying. Let's put it that way. Okay, everyone knows if you're trying or you're not trying. Okay? And be, be thoughtful. You know, if you've got a low-cut top, I'm not going to say, okay, it's got to be two centimeters from the neckline or something, three Look, that's, that's not for me. That, I, I'm just, I'm trying to preach to the new man in, in you. I'm trying to preach to your conscience, okay? I'm trying to preach to that person that's in tune with the Spirit of God so you know what is right and wrong. You know what is right and wrong, okay? This is why God doesn't have to tell us these things exactly. He gives us a general idea and it's, let's just go with that. Makes sense, okay? You know, if you've got a top ladies, bend down, look in the mirror. What's exposed? How much? Okay, be mindful, be thoughtful, okay? Husbands, play a role in how your wives get dressed, how your daughters get dressed. For church, yeah, but not just church, every aspect of life, okay? 
I, this, the reason I've, I've not preached on this early on, I've said this before, I don't want a church full of Pharisees. I don't want a church full of people dressed properly, but inwardly, you're living like the world. You know, in, uh, I just dress for church and I'll go home now, I can dress however I want. Put the pants back on. Men, put your skirts back on at home. I don't want that. I don't want that. You know, I want you to know that you've got to walk in the new man, okay? You know, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Walk in the spirit. You know what's right. You change what's on the inside first. Then the outward will naturally come, okay? A lot of these things, I, I shouldn't have to tell you. I shouldn't have to tell you. It should be common sense. And um, let me touch on breastfeeding, breastfeeding, a new baby, okay? Again, breasts are not nudity. It's, it's not nakedness. If you've got to breastfeed, you've got to breastfeed. You've got a baby, you've got you to feed the baby, okay? Every, again, common, we know this. I'm not talking about our society. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about God's people. I'm talking about you guys, okay? If a woman needs to breastfeed, breastfeed. But what did we read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9? It said, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. Shamefacedness. Ladies, you need to blush a little bit. Have a bit of shame. A little bit. It's healthy for you. Okay, to know. Sobriety. That means a serious mind. All right? If, you, if, you're, you know, if you've got to breastfeed your baby and you've got a bunch of men gathered around you, you know, it's not the right time to just flop it out and feed your baby in front of all the men. In front of everybody. That's not modesty. Oh, it's not nudity. I know it's not nudity, but it's not modesty. Okay? Do you want your brethren to stumble, to fall? You know, have some shamefacedness about you. You know, the Bible says in, um, uh, I've got a reference here. Let me just see if I can. Well, I've got to go to shamefacedness later. I'm sort of skipping over my notes a little bit. Sorry. But you know, the Bible says in 1 Peter 3.3. 3. You guys go there. Go to 1 Peter 3.3. 3. 1 Peter 3.3. 3. Now, let, let me just say, if, if someone has a little baby and you need to breastfeed, you breastfeed. I'm, I'm never going to criticize you. I'm never going to attack you, okay? Some ladies want to have a, a sleeve to cover themselves. So be it. It's their choice. It's their child. Some women would rather not have a sleeve or, or a covering. Okay, fair. It's their choice. Don't go around criticizing other women because they do things slightly differently to you. Where's the command? <laughs> you know, but be mindful, you know. Before you go and breastfeed a child, you know, don't announce it. All right, men, I'm going to breastfeed my child. All right, everyone gather around because it's not nakedness. Let me just pop it out here and I'm going to breastfeed my child. Is that how you should be? Come on, come on, common sense. Yeah, common sense is what I'm asking for. All right, now you, if someone, if a lady has a breastfeed and she finds a corner, she breast, no one's, everyone's going to be like, okay, you know, you know she's, she's being modest about it. You know, she's not trying to draw attention about it. Good, that's how you should be as ladies. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. And uh, I, I want men, you're the heads of your homes. You're in charge. God has given you your role. You've got to own it. Okay? I've got to own it. Okay? I'm in charge of my wife. I'm in charge of how my daughters dress. And look, I know, you know, we try to dress Isabel as, as modest as we can, with, with a long skirt as much as we can. But the kids grow. You know, before you know it, all of a sudden she's putting on a skirt. And I'm like, Isabel, that's too short for you. That's not intentional. It's just you don't realize kids grow, right? So when you go and you buy your daughter's a dress or even your son some shorts, keep in mind they're going to grow. You know, you're not just going to put it on. Okay, does it, does it cover your thighs? Is it up to you? Oh, great. Look, they, in two weeks they could grow. Kids keep growing, right? What's the point of having a piece of clothing that's going to last, last you just a few weeks? And then it's like, well, we spent all that money. You know, I'm not going to, what am I going to do now? Well, maybe you should have been a little smarter and bought a longer, you know, piece of clothing, you know, and make sure that it lasts a decent length of time. I understand the difficulties. I, I, I fully understand it. Christina spends hours and hours and hours looking for, not, not so much the boys, the boys are easier, but girls, looking for clothing for girls. Even little girls like em Amelia's age, sexualized clothing, okay? It's disgusting disgusting that's not just homosexuals it's pedophiles that create these clothing okay that's what they like to look at i don't want you to like to look at that you're god's people you're the children of god and uh you know i hope i've, I've shown you why women you should dress pro appropriately dress in a skirt and a dress whatever but here's the thing i'm not your i'm not your husband you know or girls i'm not your father 
You know, your father's at home. Your, the head of the house is at home. You've got to talk to them. You've got to sort it out with them. See what they say. And, you know, I've spoken to a lot of men. And look, I'm not the kind of guy that walks into someone's house. I, honestly, I, I, I don't want anything to do with your family, all right, except to preach to them at church. I don't want to sort out your family issues. You know, men, you're there for that reason, to sort out your own family issues, okay? I don't want to do it. But I have men come up to me and say, well, I would love my wife to wear a skirt. I would love my wife to wear a dress. And, you know, I talked to godly men when I was a y- younger. You know what the godly men say? People that love the Lord, love the Bible, men that will actually look after a woman, say, I don't, you know, I find women that wear skirts and dresses more attractive, they say. They're showing less than the world, okay? And you know what? I- I've seen churches where there's a lot of people and you have unsaved, worldly men come into churches looking for a wife. Why? There's a difference normally, okay? Because in the world, yeah, they see the lust of the flesh. They see the uh, promiscuous woman. There's plenty of that. That's easy. There's there's so many of them. But at at a point when they 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 get to realize, "I, I need to find a wife. I need a mother for my children. You know what they start thinking? Oh, maybe the church. Unbelievers, unsaved men. Maybe the church, because the women seem to dress well. They seem to look after themselves. They're not going around, you know, whoring themselves, hopefully. You know, that's the, that's the thought of ungodly, unsaved men. And girls, you know, I want you to find a good husband. Boys, I want you to find a godly wife, okay? And it all starts here. You know, it, when you start to neglect your clothing, when you start to dress like the world, you're not going to look anything different to the world. You're not going to be able to attract the godly man, the one that's going to look after you, the one that's going to stay with you till death do us part. You're not going to find that man. You'll find plenty of men. And, and, and boys, there's plenty of women out there. You'll find plenty of them, okay? But when you're looking for a wife, and that's what you should be looking for, okay? That's where these things, nakedness needs to be shared, is in the marriage bed, in the family uh, units between husband and wife. And so I hear things like men say, I, you know, I'd love to, you know, my wife wear a skirt and she just doesn't want to. And look, let's just, let's just give it to these wives that don't want to wear skirts. Let's just give it to them. Let's just say, yeah, all right, the Bible never says that you need to wear a skirt. The Bible never says you can't wear pants. So let's just give that to them for a minute, okay? Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. The Bible says, Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating of hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of, of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart. And that's the person I want to talk to, by the way. That's the person I want to preach to this afternoon. Okay, to the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. You say, I don't believe it's a sin to wear pants. Okay, but does your husband want you to wear a skirt? Yes. Well, then you're in sin because you're not being subject to your husband's request. You're not, being in, you know, you're not, you're not under his subjection. Okay, you may feel it's not a sin. But you disobeying your husband, going against his wishes with the way you, he wants you to dress, you are committing sin against him. You are committing sin against the Lord. Okay? And if you want your husbands to be strong men, strong leaders, a husband that loves me, a husband that will look after me, a husband that will give me attention, well, you need to learn to be submissive. And vice versa, men, you want women to be submissive, you need to learn how to be a leader. You need to show them love. You need to love them as Christ loved the church. Okay? You need to be a leader, man. But ladies, you need to understand, even if it's not, you know, in the Bible, you, you're still required to obey your husbands. Okay? Just like children are to obey their parents in everything. Does the Bible have to tell us what everything is? No. Okay? If your husband wants you in a dress, in a skirt, do it for him. Do it because you love him. Do it because you love the Lord. He's the one that put that authority over your head. And then, I know, once you do that, these passages are going to be crystal clear to you. It's going to be more obvious than you realize. All right. So last thing I want to talk about is shamefacedness. I'm sorry we've gone over time. Shamefacedness. But this is a quick one. If you guys can go, to, you guys go to Genesis 24. Sorry, Genesis chapter 2. Go to Genesis chapter 2. We'll end on this. Genesis chapter 2. 
And while you're turning there, I'll read to you from Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 15. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 15. Remember, the modest woman should have shamefacedness about her. Okay, and let me just show you what this means in Jeremiah 6, 15. It says, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Neither could they blush. When you're not ashamed and you dress immodestly, you dress naked, you're not ashamed and you can't even blush about it. What I'm saying to you is you need to bring some of that blushing back. You need to bring some of that shamefacedness back in the way you dress, okay? This is not a positive thing when they can't blush. This is a negative attribute, okay? You guys are in Genesis 2, chapter 24. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. You see, shame is part of your emotional, whatever system God has put into us, your conscience, the things that help us in life, that direct our paths, Okay? You will know, when you put on a piece of clothing, if you feel a bit ashamed about it, don't wear it, okay? That, that, start there. Put on clothing. I'm going to get dressed today. This brings me a bit of shame. Huh? This brings me a lot of un- unnecessary attention here, you know? Well, don't wear it then. Get rid of it. Oh, clothing is so expensive. It's so cheap these days, guys. It's cheap. Yes, it requires work to find the right piece of clothing, but it's there, okay? And you say, well, I can't afford it. Well, I'm sure if you just bring up the statement your bank statement for the last month. I'm sure you'll find tons of nonsense that you spent on. Absolutely rubbish things you spent on. Well, if you just didn't spend it on that, guess what? You probably could have bought yourself a new closet of clothes, okay? And if you still can't afford it, well, don't you think if you go to God and say, God, you know what? I need to fix my, my, you know, my dress. I need to fix the way I dress. I need to go and buy clothing. You don't think that God will bless you and God will provide you the finances? You don't think if you're trying to do things in accordance to God's word, he's going to help you? In that step, listen, it's worth it. It's worth it to please the Lord. Look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. We'll end on this. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Okay. Quick summary. If you're showing your nakedness in public, you ought to be ashamed of that. And if you're not ashamed, there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong, okay? You, you, there's something missing, okay? I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm just saying there's something wrong with your mind, okay? You, you, you could be uh, so into the flesh a lot more than you realize, okay? And you don't even realize when you're showing nakedness or you're being immodest. But nakedness in of itself is a good thing, in of itself, in its right place, okay? Either privately when you go have a shower, you have a bath privately, you've got to do it naked, right? Nothing sinful about that. Or as husband and wife here, okay? God put this man and woman in their home, in the Garden of Eden, they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed, okay? There's a time and place to enjoy what God has created, okay? But once again, it's in the family, okay? It's in the marriage, husband and wives, alone, privately, behind closed doors, the marriage bed. That's the right place for nakedness. Outside of that, guys, it's wrong. Outside of that is unbiblical. Outside of that is immodest, okay? So uh, I hope that gives you some things to think about. Um, if you come to, ladies, if you come to church wearing pants, I'm not going to tell you to turn around. Um, that's up to your husbands. You know, your husband, I don't know. If men come wearing a skirt, though, I don't know. <laughs> I think I'll, I think I'll tell you to leave. I'm, just, I'm, look, I'm the pastor. I get to make these judgment calls, okay? But, it, but look, here's the thing. I, I don't want to tell you. I, you need to figure it out. Men, I'm asking you. Do it in your homes, okay? Work it out, all right? But if I do find someone dressed really inappropriately, you know, I will address it with you, okay? And I'm not going to address it with you in front of everybody, okay? I'll address it with you privately. I'll just say, look, this is the situation can you cover up, okay? And if it's a man, I'll say it to the man. If it's a woman, I'll say it to her head. Okay, if it's it's a girl, I'll say it to her father. If it's a wife, I'll say it to her husband, okay? Because again, I don't want to, what's the word? I don't want to supersede, you know, the father's father's authority, the husband's authority in his home. You guys are in charge. You can do whatever you want. You know, if if you really want and you get your wife to to wear skirts at church, but then when she gets home, she wears pants, it's not going to bother me. It's not, it's, you're not doing it for me, okay? It's not about me. It's about how well can we live our lives in accordance to God's word.
And make sure you do things not to be a Pharisee, just to look good on the outside. Make sure you're right on the inside. And I'll tell you immediately, you, you do what's right on the inside, you cleanse the inside, you confess your sins before the Lord, the outward will automatically come with it. It's going to happen. I've personally seen a lot of change, even in this church, as, as the years have gone by. And as we've learned more about the Bible, as we've learned more about walking in the Spirit, I've already seen changes. I already see good things happening in this church. Okay? But maybe sometimes we need a sermon like this from time to time. All right, let's leave it there. Let's pray.